What do you know about worms? Do you know what they eat? Or how something so small can affect an entire ecosystem? A worm eats compost and waste, and through its own digestive process, enriches the soil so that plants are better able to grow. They're literally the bottom of the food chain, but they perform a vital duty for all creatures on Earth. Worms may be unaware of the effect they have on processes much larger than themselves. But the same is not true for people. Humans are capable of great empathy, even if they see no immediate benefit from their actions. This is exemplified in our penchant for philanthropy. Philanthropy is the practice of giving. Giving time, giving money, or even just giving a voice in raising awareness of an issue. It's often in pursuit of solving a problem, though it doesn't always have to be. Sometimes, it's just about making the world a better place, be it for entire nations or just one person. The desire to give can take hold in anyone, from any background. It can come from a need to leave the world a better place for future generations. It can arise from a need to spur growth and development. Or it can be a spiritual calling from a power much greater than ourselves. In the case of Wes Watkins, it was all of the above. Well, I think they, especially, well, I think Lou as well, but Wes really came of age at Oklahoma State University. I mean, they both came from uh, modest backgrounds, and in Wes's case, extremely modest. And uh, he, uh, he ended up at this, what, what was a very big place for him, and uh, it, 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 he just blossomed. I mean, this was just like he was... He was planted as a freshman, and he just blossomed uh, into the, this wonderful, uh, nurturing uh, tree. I came to OSU from a southeast part of the state, from a very small community. Uh, I have to admit that I was probably one of the greenest country kids that you could ever imagine. And I got to OSU, and people were willing to help. The whole world opened up to me here at Oklahoma State University. Well, going back even before that, coming up from moving to Bennington in deep southeast Oklahoma, which is a very small but but uh, a lot of poverty around Bennington and around that area. Wes uh, had an alcoholic father. His mom and dad were divorced four or five times. We never could really determine the exact number. And his, his dad was not around a lot of the time to give nurture and leadership to Wes's family. Um, but Wes comes from that background, comes to Oklahoma State, uh, and the world really opened up to him here in Stillwater. I worked uh, on the poultry farm and worked uh, at the OSU Infirmary and, and also at the OSU Library. And most of those days I, I was up at 4 a.m. in the morning uh, in order to do that work and have enough hours. So I felt that uh, people here at Oklahoma State were wouldn't help uh, no matter what your background may be. He also lived in a converted chicken house his first year at Oklahoma State. And yeah, my background started in agriculture. In fact, I majored in agriculture mainly because uh, the one person that kind of influenced me a great deal was my agriculture teacher, Harold Chitwood. And he had a, a major role in my life, but kind of being a second father in the absence of, since my father was gone early in my life, most of the time. And uh, that's the only professional kind of person I knew. And so I was going to come in uh, OSU and major in agriculture education. I was planning to go be an ag teacher, go back and influence the young men at that time. Now it's men and young ladies uh, trying to hopefully inspire them to go and do more in their life. And uh, one of the key things, again, when you look and realize that that area of the state was known for welfare. Uh, but as a result, uh, the unemployment, the underemployed, uh, all the things, uh, my dad, uh, as I mentioned, left us basically early because he searched for jobs. And he lost uh, opportunities there, and it really affected his self-esteem. And uh, my dad spent more of his time in California and came back and forth, and I went to California three times before I was nine years old. And uh, my family in what I call economic survival. 
trips back and forth. And my dad uh, uh, basically uh, turned to alcohol, and et cetera, and it affected, made me want to hopefully find a young lady that I could uh, build a life with. And uh, so I ended up marrying a preacher's kid. And she wasn't a student at OSU at that time, but as I indicated, uh, my uh, early jobs were at the poultry farm and on the, at the OSU infirmary. And, and then I got uh, probably the best job on the campus, and that was the lead doorman at the OSU library and checking out books and such like that. And it's a, a Christmas uh, about 53 years ago that uh, I was uh, working and my uh, helpmate there at the door, he said, uh, there's a cute little girl up on second floor studying. And so I proceeded to check that young lady out a little bit. And when she came out, of course, I had to check her books. And the books there, uh, I found her name to be Lou Rogers, and I struck up a conversation with her. And, and as I mentioned, I was checking out the books, but I was checking a few other things also, you know, uh, along the way. And uh, as a result, we, uh, she came back the next night. Now, her side of the story says that uh, I had asked her to go get coffee, and she turned me down. And so, uh, but she came back the next night to study. Uh, that's what she said that she's doing. And as a result, we struck up another, another conversation because she had political science books. And I really didn't have any intention of dating or doing anything other than getting my schoolwork done. So uh, when Wes asked me out, I, I said, no, I really didn't have time. And I don't think he'd been turned down for a date in quite a while. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, he, it, I think it was tantalizing to him. And then he uh, came to Cushing, actually, on that Sunday weekend and uh, hunted up our home and knocked on our door and visited with my parents, and one thing led to another. So here we are 53 years later. Well, and on our first dates, uh, Wes would uh, take a napkin out of the napkin holder at a pizza place and sketch out uh, the way he could see the development of Oklahoma evolving. And so that was our... <coughs> topic on dates, <laughs> and so uh, he was different from <laughs> anybody else I had ever gone out with. Wes's napkin plans for Oklahoma followed him after his graduation from OSU. In 1962, Wes moved to Maryland to continue his studies, but his home and his heart lay in Oklahoma, and he never stopped working to improve the area he was from. Now, when I first left OSU, I was working on my doctorate at the University of Maryland right outside of Washington, D.C. And what I was doing is working to, on a paper that would set up a multi-county organization for economic growth of Southeast Oklahoma. The Department of Commerce in Washington, D.C. adopted a lot of that and set up the EDA Act of 1965 and set up the economic development districts throughout the state. I was, President Wilhelm of OSU had asked the day, that week we came back to get married. So he called us the first part of August. Lou and I got married in June. We went back to Washington, D.C. I went back to the University of Maryland. She was at American University. And the phone rang in early August, and it's President Wilhelm offering the job to me to come back and be the first uh, high school relations person for the in our state. I did that for four years. I went to every high school in the state that would let us come. I went out and preached the gospel of OSU and tried to inspire young people to come to Oklahoma State. I enjoyed that job. I was really, you know, something. But then I got the call from a couple of editors or newspaper publishers in southeast Oklahoma. They were setting up the Kaimishi Economic Development District which is part of the basic program I'd written about. His real focus was on building uh, infrastructure in terms of dams and uh, uh, you know, water systems and things of this nature. But he was also concerned that people didn't possess the adequate skills to really push themselves forward. So Wes was one of the significant innovators and in uh, developing the Votech system around southeast Oklahoma. And 
knew that it was really critical for people uh, if they were going to better their, themselves in lives was to develop their job skills. So he, you know, he raised up these Votex systems all over the place and created the incubator system and really developed a job, a job development in Oklahoma significantly. At first, a political career was not on Wes's radar, but his natural inclination to help people and improve their lives made him realize that it was where he could do the most good. And I just finished serving as a president of the student senate and president of the student body here at Oklahoma State University. Uh, I'd been quite heavily involved in student leadership activities, and I did not know personally at that time or prior to it that uh, that probably lead me into the political game. And a young man that night I was elected president of the student body asked me if I was going to go into politics. And I thought, you know, what would I do if I went into politics? I wish more people would ask that question. But I asked that question. And I thought about my background in the Southeast Oklahoma and the educational level and the unemployment, the welfare, uh, the uh, problems we had economically throughout that area of just having jobs. And I thought, well, you know, if I could do something about that, if I could help solve those kind of problems, I might consider going into politics. And though I didn't know exactly at that time, but I started thinking about maybe Congress, a big enough area that I could take all that Southeast Oklahoma in, in, a, in that way of uh, serving in political life. And uh, that was kind of the way it was born uh, in my thought and pattern. He runs for the state senate back in Ada and wins a seat and serves there for a couple of terms. And uh, this is in the summer of 1976. He hears that Carl Albert, uh, the sitting congressman in southeast Oklahoma in the 3rd Congressional District uh, and the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, is going to retire. So West jumps in the race and... No one gave Wes a chance. He was running against Charlie Ward, who was Speaker Albert's administrative assistant and really alter ego, and, and uh, no one gave Wes a real chance. But he ends up uh, winning the, uh, both the primary and the runoff by several thousand votes. He laughs and campaigns that he never took any Washington, D.C. money. Well, the fact is, he was never offered any. All that money went to Charlie Ward. Wes was able to go to someone and sort of pierce that bubble that we have around us and create a personal connection with his constituents. And he did that literally thousands and thousands of times. And, you know, he still does that. Wes comes in and he, he has a real ability to, um, to connect with people on an interpersonal level in a relevant and sincere way. And that was one of his secrets in, in politics. It was really interesting to talk to former members of Congress that had served with Wes, uh, because Congress was different back then when, than it is now in terms of uh, the, the culture and the, the nature of people working together. You know, back then when Wes was in Congress, the Democrats control the House, but he would, uh, he would do his work in the committee meetings and disagree spiritly uh, w with great vigor uh, with Republicans in, in the context, but then they would go to dinner that night with their wives and play bridge or, or interact as, as people. So Congress operated a little differently back then than it does, than it does now. West really was able to build relationships across the aisle and, um, and get things done and make things better. In 1980, I got Payne County in my district. Now, I was excited. I had all the area down there where I was grow, grew up as a boy. But I got up here where I'd come up and really matured as a man. Also, Cushing is Lou's hometown, just 25 miles here in Payne County. So, hey, we, that was ideal. I had a town hall meeting in the uh, cafeteria area of the student union. It was full of people here. That's 1980. And I gave them a pep talk and told them how glad I was to be here and all that. Everything went really great, and I turned it over to question and answer. And a fellow, one of the wealthy guys here in town, raised his hand and asked the question. I said, yeah, tell me, 
What's your question? He said, what do we have in common with those people down there? I melted. I melted down because I had worked trying to bring students here. I worked to try to build the economy, you know, back when I was even a student. Now, I'd like to share with you something about we should never make a judgment. Henry G. Bennett. We all know who Henry G. Bennett is. He was born in the edge of Arkansas. His first professional job was at Boswell, Oklahoma, in Choctaw County, teaching. That was 10 miles from where I grew up as a boy. He went on to Hugo as the superintendent of schools. He went from Hugo to Southeastern as president of Southeastern. And then he came to OSU and spent 20 some odd years as a great visionary leader for Oklahoma State. Southeast Oklahoma product. You heard of Boone Pickens? Yes, sir. Boone Pickens happens to come from Holdenville, Oklahoma, from Southeast Oklahoma. You ever heard Bartlett Fine Arts Center here on the campus? Mm -hmm. That's not named after the s senator and governor. That's named after Pete Bartlett, who was born in the Kaimishi Mountains in the area. You ever seen the engineering aviation programs up here? Mm -hmm. That's been funded more dollars put in that by Ray Booker a fellow who was born and raised in Antlers, Oklahoma, from Southeast Oklahoma. Ask yourself the question, why would people coming out of such economic areas want to give so much back to a university? Could it be because they're so grateful for what they've been able to do? They've seen what opportunities could be given to young people. Could it be that they're thankful that they had that opportunity and they want to give it to others. So I think there's a possibility you'll see a lot of other people give from time to time. Well, it, it all, I think, hinges on the affinity they, uh, a person has with a, uh, with a program or, uh, or some other area of the university. Uh, and usually inspired by their experience that when they were here and they they feel like it benefited them and and contributed to their success and so they want to give back uh, it uh, if you don't have that affinity connection it's it's pretty hard to raise money from people well you know Wes is a, was a real combination of uh, independence and, and co and, and working with other people. Uh, he, he wanted to give people an opportunity in Southeast Oklahoma to build a life for themselves if they were willing to, to have the aspiration and have the ambition and go forward and do things on their own. Uh, so he was, really, he was really interested in um, helping people in that regard. Well, of course, when Wes Watkins was in Congress, he was always looking for opportunities to uh, help OSU. And, and so OSU's uh, West Watkins Center, which we named after him, uh, was, uh, was certainly one of those programs that he was able to help fund. One that people don't know so much about, actually, and uh, which I think is going to benefit OSU mightily, is the extension of the runway. Uh, which it, 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 we will now have commercial air service from Oklahoma State to Dallas. Uh, <clears throat> but apart from, and of course they've done scholarships to help students uh, just like them, but apart from, uh, from that, the direct monetary benefits, uh, the Watkins are uh, very generous with their time with OSU. Lou is the incoming chairman of the Board of Regents. She's been on the Board of Regents for many, many years and is uh, such a strong advocate for our university and what we're doing here. My passion, uh, first of all, was to try to build a better world. <laughs> uh, I think that's why I went into political science because I felt like um, that was an opportunity for people to create a better world and, and do the right thing. And then um, I started teaching when we lived in Wilburton and I found out that I loved, actually loved, the classroom and, and working with students and my passion became uh, what is your dream and how do you how does your dream come true and uh, helping students map out their future and uh, not just collect knowledge but to actually put together a, a plan for their their lives 
They're especially strong advocates for our international outreach programs and our, our uh, service to the state of Oklahoma in, in facilitating trade, foreign trade. Uh, so uh, they, they are a beautiful example of time, people sharing their time and their treasure. One of the things I wish uh, more of us would do would be to raise our sights on what we can do to help other people. It's amazing how we can go out and, and maybe spend $50 or $100 on a dinner one night. The difference that that makes when you donate that to the youth shelter or when you invest it in a student's life who's just trying to get new spark plugs for their truck uh, makes a huge difference. And if we would think more in terms of the, sometimes it's not a big thing that people need to boost themselves, but it's more uh, being involved to know what it is, and it may not be huge at all. And if more people would do that, it would make our communities and our lives so much better. Wes and Lou don't just give back to Oklahoma State. They're also active in the Stillwater community and in the state of Oklahoma at large, giving their time and energy to some important organizations. Tonight was our uh, annual fundraising dinner. Uh, it is uh, our primary fundraiser, and we've had it now for, I think this is the fourth year, the fifth year that we've had it. Uh, and it uh, generates funding for um, the, the shelter and now for our uh, expanded programs in Perry and Cushing and we hope also in Guthrie by this time next year. The Watkins were our um, honorary chair people. Uh, Lou attended every meeting we had for about the last six months. She was just terrific. And uh, Lou's value is her knowledge of the community, her willingness to open up her Rolodex and, and send emails, make phone calls. And, uh, and it was wonderful to have Wes here and, and stand up in front of everybody and, and in good humor, ask them to open up their billfolds and, and uh, give us money. And that's exactly what happened. Well, you know, fundraising is a little, if you analyze leadership, it really is about being able to articulate uh, a, a shared value and, uh, and your plan to, to, to maximize that, that you have a vision uh, which supports your values. And, and so to get, you need to, you need to be able to persuade or to attract people who share that value uh, and they will, uh, they'll support it if they can. And a lot of it has to do with where they are in life. I mean, what's their liquidity at any given time? You know, as you get older, you've already bought the couch and the refrigerator and, and all the necessities of life, and you've got some disposable income. And what are you going to do with it? And if, uh, if you can uh, feed your value, in effect, uh, then you probably will. Um, in a small community like this, uh, people see the effects of, of Wings of Hope and they understand what it is and what we're doing. I think, I think much more readily than in a, in a larger community. I'm sure in a larger community you have a, you know, a, a small circle that, that will support you, but here we have the whole community supporting us. And uh, not just Wings of Hope, but there, there are several um, organizations like Wings of Hope that help families and, and children as well. And uh, every one of them is supported by the community. We're very lucky. So what does any of this have to do with worms? We were living a day at that time and I went to uh, get on the plane. I left at four o'clock every morning uh, to catch a six o'clock plane out of Oklahoma City. An uh, elderly person came on, a couple came on the plane. I, let them sit down in my chair and I had to find another one back to back because I won't let, won't let them sit together. Sat down a guy who was in vermiculture, worm farming, and found out about it. And I asked him, I said, hey, what, what do they eat? He said, they love animal waste, animal waste, manure. So I thought, wow, 
chicken manure leaching into water. Maybe if we could get worms that could help. What happens when worms eat the waste, the manure? EPA calls it harmful waste. The result, the worm digesting, a worm's got a gizzard, like a chicken gizzard. They grind at the manure. That environmental harmful waste becomes the ultimate organic fertilizer. It doesn't leach out like wa the manure or the waste. So I set up a, a worm farm out north of town here in my, my ranch using manure and other things. My grandkids, they ask about, people ask about their grandpa, they said, well, he's playing in worm poop. <laughs> 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 so I said, who's better to understand that? worms and manure than ex-congressman. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I found that after several years, I, when we sold a ranch, we had assets there that we had to turn into something else. So we gave it to the OSU Foundation and endowed four Matthew 2540 scholarships. Matthew 2540 Mission is the nonprofit organization that Lou and I set up about the time when I came out of Congress. So we said that we had enough revenue there to, to endow four scholarships. Later, several years ago, about three years ago, we sold some other assets and investments and we endowed eight more scholarships. So we have 12 Matthew 25 scholars, that's what we call them, Matthew 25, 40 scholars, scholarships provide to travel abroad service scholarships, not to go to Paris or London or the lights of Rome, but to go to Sudan, Ethiopia, Sierra Leone, Southeast Asia, also to work in it. We have seven billion people in the world. About half those seven billion, about 3.5 or so, are in poverty. About one billion people are going to bed Hungry tonight. That one billion. How many, how many is hundred? How many is one billion? That's three times the population of the United States of America, with some left over, is going. They're going to bed hungry tonight. Yeah. We must if we're going to have peace, if we're going to have opportunities, we got to try to chip away at that and do what we can to solve it. That's what we're trying to do with Matthew twenty-five forty. It all started when we were working with the worms. And we now have got 12 endowed scholarship. We're gonna do more. We're gonna do more. Giving back and making the world a better place, literally from the ground up.